Hi, I'm Dr. Kaman. I'm one of the attendings here at Ohio State, and I'm also the clerkship director for emergency medicine. So we're working today to make a video to talk a little bit about the optimal or exemplar student presentation of a patient in the emergency department. So a couple things that I just want to hit on. When you go see a patient in the ED, it's important that you pick up that patient, sign up for the patient, and then immediately go see the patient. Um, I don't want to have a patient be nauseated, vomiting, not breathing, in extremis, anything like that, and you guys are on the computer looking at old clinic notes. I think it's important that you go right in and assess the patient. Remember, a lot of things in the ED are time sensitive. Stroke, STEMI, sepsis, um, vascular issues, you know, a cold, pulseless leg. Those things can't wait for you to look through old clinic notes. Then go in and see the patient and come out and find me and give me that presentation. So this is a very succinct, concise, two to three minute presentation. And it's focused on the chief complaint. So what I want to hear is chief complaint and then past medical history pertinent to the patient and the HBI. For example, somebody comes in with chest pain. It's very different to me, um, chief complaints, chest pain, Mr. Smith is a 25-year-old male who comes in with chest pain versus Mr. Smith is a 54-year-old smoker with hypertension who presents with chest pain. So I like those pertinent historical factors in the HPI. Um, so give me that HPI in the Codier's format, um, very succinct, focused to the chief complaint, meds and allergies focused to the chief complaint. If somebody's on Coumadin or aspirin or blood thinners, Things like that, we need, we need and want to know about those things. And then the past medical history, again, things that are pertinent to the chief complaint. Sometimes someone might have 30 past medical problems, but it's, it's really, um, I think, paramount that students tell us the ones that are, are pertinent. Um, surgical history, pertinent to the chief complaint. Family history, again, if it is pertinent to the chief complaint. A patient comes in with chest pain, and shortness of breath, and cardiac disease runs in the family. Father died of an MI at the age of 45. I want to know that. Somebody rolls their ankle, and they have a family history of, um, you know, bleeding disorder. That might be pertinent, but otherwise, in a traumatic patient, family history might not be. Uh, social history again pertinent to the chief complaint. You can put your review of systems in the HPI. And then I want to hear your physical exam. And again, the key to the physical exam is when I walk in the room, I want to see exactly what you described to me. Those are the best presentations is when I walk in the room and the picture that I formed in my mind while you were presenting is what I see in the room. So I walk in and, and you tell me that the patient has tachycardia. You give me their vitals. You tell me what they look like. This patient is in no acute distress watching television. Um, I did a focused cardiac exam. I listened to their heart and lungs. Those were normal. I checked for pedal edema. I checked for JVD. Um, that's the pertinent physical exam. Lymphatics might not be pertinent on every, ex on every patient. But if somebody comes in with um, a headache, I want to hear a full neuro exam. Um, and then I want your tiered differential diagnosis. So those are things most likely and most um, dangerous to the patient to the less likely and and the system that we've used is a tiered differential diagnosis with tier one being the most likely and the most concerning so in a patient with chest pain ACS PE dissection less likely for me would be um, pleurisy um, pneumonia those kinds of things and then tier two is your between 20 and 80 percent likely diagnoses and then tier three are the least likely. And then give us your assessment and plan. And that assessment and plan, we want to be specific and we really want you to take ownership of the patient. So in a patient with abdominal pain, I don't want you to say, well, I'm concerned about PID and I want to give them antibiotics. I want you to say, I'm concerned about PID and I want to give the patient rocephin and doxycycline um, and then send the patient out with two weeks of doxycycline, something much more specific, and you could even give me the dose. Um, and then again, following your patient through 
with frequent updates for the attending. Those are some of the um, ways that you can present a patient and follow a patient on your clerkship um, and really do the best you can. Let's revisit each part of the presentation in more detail. HOPI and other histories. In the ED, the history of presenting illness, past medical history, past surgical and social histories are normally woven together. For our patient, the type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia are potentially important as they are risk factors for cardiac disease. However, osteoarthritis and anxiety and depression need not be mentioned. For the HOPI, Following along with code ears, or a similar acronym, for the chief complaint is critical, along with routine need to ask questions that correspond to specific chief complaints. For example, any chest pain pa patient needs to be asked how the pain changes with exertion, what their family history of cardiac disease is, etc. Female pelvic pain patients need to be asked about likelihood of pregnancy, even though even if you will test for it later. They should also be asked about birth control and sexual activity, amongst other questions. Answers to these questions should usually be reported whether they are positive or negative. Other HOPI, not specifically related to the chief complaint, can be omitted or noted briefly at the very end of the history narrative so that the attending is aware and can investigate further if he or she so desires. You will ask questions to understand the progression of the illness or timeline that brought the patient into the ED. When actually presenting, you will explain the, these events out of order. For example, a patient may have first noticed they were getting more, more short of breath with exertion over a year ago. This slowly worsened and after running out of his medication five days ago, began to have trouble breathing even when resting. Now he's sitting in front of you requiring BiPAP for a CHF exacerbation. Instead of reporting chronologically, it is nearly in the reverse order. For example, this is a 70-year-old male presenting with severe dyspnea. He ran, a, he ran out of his Lasix five days ago and has progressive shortness of breath. He first noticed shortness of breath with, with exertion about a year ago, and currently at baseline he's able to walk about a block before requiring rest, and he sleeps with two pillows under his head at night. He has not been hospitalized previously for dyspnea or heart failure. Physical exam. The physical exam should be limited to vitals, a comment on general appearance, uh, that is, sick or not sick, and exam areas corresponding to the chief complaint along with relevant abnormal findings. Other areas and organ systems need not be noted. The vitals can often be wrapped into a blanket statement such as unremarkable or normal and stable. If one vital is normal, it is okay to say the patient is tachycardic to the hundreds. Vitals are otherwise normal. Attendings need to always be notified immediately if a patient appears imminently sick or toxic. An example for our patient would be, his vitals are unremarkable, he looks well and is only in mild discomfort, his heart and lung exams are normal, however he does have some epigastric tenderness to deep palpation. Note we did not say heart sounds with normal S1 and S2, no, no murmurs, gallops, or rubs appreciated. This may be documented, but for the sake of presentation, it is an unnecessary detail. Labs and imaging. There is often no labs or imaging to report. If there are new labs or imaging, say a chest x-ray, 
you need to only mention any abnormalities. However, prior imaging may be relevant to reports such as a chest pain patient with a recent cardiac cath or a potential stroke patient with recent head imaging. For our patient, we do have the normal EKG, which is important to mention for a chest pain patient, but any other labs imaging desired that are not yet obtained will be mentioned as a part of the plan. Assessment and plan. The assessment should follow logically from the HOPI, past medical history, labs, and imaging. As a medical student, attendings will expect a fleshed out differential with ex explanations for each possible diagnosis, including supporting or contradicting evidence. The format will include the diagnosis of high suspicion, followed by a discussion of any life-threatening conditions that need to be ruled out, and then ending with other less likely but still possible diagnoses. The big difference between an assessment in the ED is the need to rule out any life-threatening conditions, even if the suspicion is low for them. Once the assessment has been given, move on to the plan. The extra piece needed in the ED is a possible comment on the disposition of the patient, whether they will be admitted, held for observa observation, or discharge. If it is clear that the patient is going to need admission regardless of test results in the ED, putting in admission orders early can get a patient a bed upstairs more quickly. Oftentimes, admission versus discharge is dependent on tests in the ED, and it is okay to note at this at the end of the presentation. Do your best coming up with a plan, both diagnostic and therapeutic. You may be familiar with the initial workup for a wide range of common chief complaints. Remember to order labs and imaging needed to rule out life-threatening causes. Some of the workup for non-life-threatening causes can sometimes be saved for other outpatient settings, such as the PCP's office. Also be sure to address immediate complaints, including pain and nausea. We will save the full fleshed out differential and plan for the completed presentation at the end. Here's a quick overview. The most likely diagnosis is gastritis or peptic ulcer disease. However, we also need to rule out ACS causes and potentially also a AAA. Other much less likely causes could be pancreatitis, biliary colic, anxiety, or musculoskeletal causes. For the plan, Diagnostically, the patient got an EKG on arrival. He will also need delta troponins, a chest x-ray, uh, lipase, as well as a CBC. Uh, we would also need to potentially obtain a abdominal ultrasound to rule out a AAA. We will start him on a PPI, both as therapeutic and potentially diagnostic reasons. For disposition, it would be appropriate to send this gentleman to the observation unit given his risk factors for cardiovascular disease. While in the OBS unit, we will get a stress test and echocardiogram along with initial treatment for PUD. I will now put it all together in my presentation to Dr. Kaman. Hey, Dr. Kaman. I'm Prashant. I'm a fourth-year medical student. Hi, Dr. Kaman. I'm the attending over here today. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Um, first time working together. Do you have any goals or anything you want to accomplish on this shift today? Well, I'd like to um, work on my ED presentations. I know they're um, different from um, presentations that are done on the floor, and I'd like to really work on that and get them streamlined. Okay. I can maybe try to help you with that. So you went and saw a patient in three, right? That's right, yeah. You want to tell me about it? Sure. I just saw Mr. Smith. He's a uh, six-year-old white male um, with a history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. Uh, he's coming here with three days of intermittent chest pain that's substernal. Uh, non-exertional in quality, non-radiating, uh, not associated with diaphoresis. Uh, he states that he gets minimal relief with Tums, but can't identify any exacerbating factors. He also uh, endorses a cough that's been going on for about a month. Uh, it's a dry cough, and, and it's woken him up at night at times. Um, other review systems, uh, he's negative for shortness of breath, uh, no nausea, vomiting. Uh, no abdominal pain, no melanoma or hematochesia. He also denies sick contacts, fevers, chills. Um, Mr. Smith, uh, his medications currently include uh, aspirin, metformin, hydrochlorothiazide, simvastatin, uh, as well as naproxen for, uh, for his osteoarthritis. He states his, that he's been taking more naproxen recently because he's been doing more yard work. Um, in terms of his family history, um, it's significant for a premature MI in his father who passed away at the age of 45. Uh, his mother also has diabetes as well as hypertension. Uh, Mr. Smith's other risk factors include a 40-pack year smoking history. Um, he's also a social drinker. Uh, in terms of my physical exam, um, looking at his vitals, they were within normal limits. Uh, 
my physical exam was remarkable for epigastric pain uh, induced on palpation. I didn't appreciate any perit peritoneal signs. Uh, I, I listened to his heart and lungs, and those sounded normal to me. I also palpated his um, peripheral pulses on all four extremities, and those are also uh, normal to me. Uh, I have here his EKG, which was uh, obtained on presentation. Um, my inter interpretation of it is that there are no uh, ST changes. Um, Do you have any old ones for comparison? Uh, we don't have any old ones. Okay. Good. Thanks for bringing that. So, what's your assessment of this patient? So, um, I think with this presentation, um, what tops my differential is uh, gastritis or perhaps even a peptic ulcer, um, given his increased use of NSAIDs and um, the location of his pain. Uh, given his uh, cardiovascular history and his age and his um, history of smoking, I am also concerned for an acute uh, coronary syndrome. Um, we did get the EKG um, to uh, initially screen for that. Uh, I'd also be concerned for a aortic dissection or a triple A given his hypertension and smoking history. Uh, lower down on my list, I would probably also include um, pancreatitis uh, as well as uh, potentially biliary colic, um, although again, the location of his pain was epigastric. Okay. And so your plan would be to do? Sure, so moving forward, I'd like to keep him in our observation unit. Um, I'd like to obtain troponins on him, also a chest x-ray. Um, while he's here to assess for the AAA and, and dissection. Trauma level two, two minutes. Trauma level two, two minutes. Well, we're going to have to go to that in a little bit, but go ahead and finish up. Okay. Um, so, again, while he's here, I'd like to get a, a bedside ultrasound to assess for the AAA and the um, uh, dissection. Um, and then, of course, the uh, stress test to assess for ACS. Um, additionally, to address the pancreatitis, we can get a lipase. I'd also like to get a CBC on him to check his hemoglobin hematocrit, see if he's become anemic. Okay. Um, you want to give him any medication while he's here? Sure. Uh, I think to, um, a, you know, hopefully alleviate his pain, we could start him on a PPI to see if that makes a difference. And, um, you know, if you're worried about ACS, we should probably give him an aspirin, but you said that he's on aspirin daily. Did he take his aspirin today? You know, I didn't ask that. It's something I can go back and ask or we can go in together. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Let's go see him. All right. Final pointers. Be honest if you forget to ask a question or do an exam component. It is understood that attendings have been interviewing patients for many years and are experts at pattern recognition. As medical students, you only have been seeing patients for one to two years and have even less experience in the acute setting of the ED. Each attending may want slightly different information or presentation formats. Be flexible. In addition, be ready to share any informa information omitted from the presentation if asked or if it seems like it has become relevant. Assessing whether a patient is sick or not and deciding on disposition are two of the harder skills to learn in the ED. Many cases are clear cut, but those that are fuzzy are the best opportunities for learning. If a patient ever seems emergently sick or unstable, be sure to tell your attending immediately. There will be time for the patient interview later after the attending has laid eyes on the patient.